SS. And you have to think about this. I mean, these are fellow SS members describing him as a deplorable human being, wow. yeah, even within the ranks of the Nazi uh, regime. And there are some very colorful quotes in, in the book, The Hidden Nazi, words like henchmen and rare obstinacy, but phrases, a physical description that described his mouth that indicated brutality, derision, disdain, and overweening pride. And from Von Braun, who you mentioned, uh, Von Braun called him a character acrobat, a dynamic personality, actor, criminal, all in one person. And one of his deputies described Kamler as the worst person I've ever seen. And it was all downhill from there, believe it or not. And again, if you appreciate these comments within the context of World War II, within the Nazi regime, within the SS, it really is uh, – it paints an extraordinary picture. But what I mean when I say Kemmler helped make the Holocaust possible, even though he was one of tens of thousands of people involved in that, he literally laid out the blueprint for these expanded camps, the infrastructure, the water supplies and sanitation such as it was, the roadways, the railways, the meets and bounds. Uh, he also designed the standard concentration camp barrack, the classic uh, uh, barrack that you see in, in all the newsreels and in all the World War II movies. The architectural drawings bear his signature at the bottom. Uh, he even overruled an underling's design for brick barracks in favor of cheaper wooden barracks. So brick, of course, would have provided better protection from the cold and the wind, uh, but that was really no concern of Kamler's. Um, he overruled his underling's plans even for the number of people to be housed in each barracks. They were already crammed to capacity with 550 people per building, and, and we have a, a drawing, a blueprint uh, w with a handwritten a handwriting in the margin where the number 550 is struck through, and the number 774 is written over, and that's the the new number of people to be put in an already over over cramped uh, barracks, and that. That was the standard for concentration camps throughout the Reich. This is not just Auschwitz, um, but this was sort of the uh, the Model T plan for barracks throughout the Reich. Um, and then we have documents that show he made just ceaseless visits to campsites to oversee the construction. He was a hands-on uh, manager, and his peers at this point used the expression "stabwalk," which uh, translates as "dust cloud" to describe him. That's it's a vivid description of him. Uh, Kamler racing from one concentration project to another, shouting orders, demanding changes, um, you know, requiring written reports daily from all of these facilities uh, and, and throughout the Reich, uh, not just the major camps, but smaller camps uh, and on and on. Um, and if that isn't damning enough, he then uh, next turned to the installation of, of the gas chambers and the ovens uh, at these same camps. And we have document after document that show him uh, standing up an architectural office at at, uh, at Auschwitz, um, and then him in charge of the design and installation of the gas chambers and the ovens that, of course, killed millions of people and then sought to destroy the uh, the evidence. And he designed them, he installed them, and he oversaw the repairs uh, when they faltered. Uh, from the documents, you really get a sense of the urgency and frenetic pace um, and the priority he put on it. Um, and this is all uh, – there's one sort of interesting little vignette that's in the book that I thought was interesting, and, and I'll mention it here because he he was also a, a family man. He uh, – by the time he was 29 in 1930, he gets married in a June wedding in a small town in, in central Germany, uh, a town, uh, Nomburg, that, that was uh, the childhood home of, of Nietzsche. Uh, the Saul River runs through it. It has an annual Hussite Cherry Festival in June. Uh, he married his wife, Judah Kamler, in June uh, in 1930. They went on to have five children, um, but two of whom uh, died early. Uh, two daughters died early, one of whom um, it just died in a, in a, a terribly distressing, I think, in, in a horribly ironic way. Uh, she was an infant, uh, and the nurse tending her left open a bottle of chloroform near the baby, uh, and the baby um, died from inhaling the chloroform fumes. Um, and, of course, Kamler then went on to build gas chambers that killed uh, millions of people, men, women, and children. Um, and it's just – it struck me as – I don't know what to take away from it, that, that, that he would have a child die from the inhalation of gas and go on to, uh, to build uh, these camps and, and, and the gas chambers themselves. Uh, just uh, really tragic. Yeah, a lot to psychoanalyze there, but you don't have to speculate much 
with him because of all the evidence. And I mean, it's interesting what you detailed because the Holocaust is described with the industrial ethnic cleansing of a people that Hitler might not be alone in his cruelty because a generation earlier you have the Armenian genocide and the Ottoman Empire, but it doesn't have the industrial ruthlessness of the Third Reich. And it sounds like Kamler is a big part of this. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'm very curious about something that's mentioned in the book about how far the Nazis had come in their nuclear research. I would love to hear about this, Kamler's role, because the little I understand of Nazi nuclear research is that with the destruction of infrastructure like the Norwegian heavy water plant, it's what the traditional narrative is as the Third Reich begins to retract and its infrastructure is destroyed, it doesn't have the resources to complete its nuclear weapons project the way that the United States does with its vast intact infrastructure. So what's going on there? Yeah, there's plenty going on there. And, and you know, we don't come to, I don't think, a definitive conclusion that, that the Nazis were definitely further along than uh, history would report in nuclear research. But there are a lot of indicators that they were. First of all, the conclusions that the Americans and the Western allies reached about advances in Nazi research come from uh, a couple primary uh, sources. One are the tapes uh, made of the incarcerated Nazi scientists. Uh, they were all in, in the same compound, um, not, you know, don't envision um, bars and cells, but envision a, a country manor uh, with rooms and, and gardens and things like that. There were microphones everywhere. And from these uh, recordings, um, the Americans came to believe that the Nazis really didn't make significant progress um, towards a nuclear weapon. Uh, in fact, Hitler had suspended uh, research uh, towards a nuclear weapon uh, fairly early in the war. He thought his belief was that, you know, with all the success they'd had in, in, in the continent, especially the Western continent, uh, they would just sweep to victory uh, and the war would be concluded before they needed a nuclear weapon. Um, so he suspended that research. Research did continue on uh, nuclear propulsion, that is, uh, and nuclear energy. So the use uh, for use of a nuclear reactor uh, that could have a controlled use uh, and lead to a, a, a nuclear sub, perhaps, or or some other sort of nuclear power. Um, and at Farm Hall, this this uh, collection point for Nazi scientists, uh, some of the scientists did say some things that were um, uh, that would indicate, I would say, that the Nazis hadn't made a lot of progress uh, towards the bomb. But they they did have a head start. Nuclear fission was discovered in Germany before the war started uh, by Otto Hahn. Um, and there's also, um, uh, I don't know what to describe this as, but a sort of a ploy by the Nazi scientists called De Les Art, uh, which was uh, the device. This was, this was an attempt, a coordinated attempt by them to mislead the Americans as to uh, the, the advances the Germans had made and the German scientists had made and their willingness to sort of serve the Nazis. Uh, and you, you have to it, you do well to recall the context here. These are these are prisoners. Uh, they're looking for a post post war life. Uh, they don't want to be put in the same boat as uh, the ideologue Nazis, certainly not as the SS. Um, they want to explain their behavior during the war as as scientific research, uh, and they want to minimize the extent to which they might have been making a weapon that could, uh, you know, be an existential threat to England or to the United States or any of the Western allies for for that matter. Um, so those those farm hall transcripts are not complete. First of all, they they don't run you know continuously from beginning to end. Um, there's strong indications that the the Nazi scientists knew they were being recorded. So uh, that gives you an additional level of skepticism for everything they uh, um, everything they said. And they did have this awareness that that they wanted to be careful about what they said, so they didn't indict themselves. So I, I think the farm hall transcripts are not very very helpful. But the second major component the 
the Allies uh, relied on in reaching the conclusion that the Nazis didn't get very far in, in nuclear weapons research uh, was something called the ALSOS mission. That's A-L-S-O-S. Um, and this was a group of um, Americans mostly who followed uh, the front lines and explored sites um, – nuclear research sites as they were captured by the advancing allies as german territory was uh, given back to the uh, to the to the allies um the book goes into a lot of detail about the infirmities in that alsos process um and you know i i can reproduce some of that here but it really does take a, a careful reading of it w one of the most damning things uh, i think that we came upon is a statement by uh, one of the two leaders of that project who said the the vastness of the materials and the size uh, that were such that uh, no real intelligence team of any size could have accomplished the the mission uh it, it really is a, a striking concession that um, you know, there's just no way really to to, to undertake this uh, process of proving a negative. Uh, the other thing I think that's truly you know damning of the Alsos mission is uh, they reached a definitive conclusion that no substantial uh, progress had been made uh, before they actually entered Germany, um, and all their uh, all their research, all the sites they visited was was based on pre-war intelligence. Uh, they complained uh, about uh, finding facilities that had been ransacked by earlier troops or that had been evacuated by retreating Germans or files that were destroyed by retreating Germans. Uh, so it's very clear to me uh, that I don't think they got a complete picture. Um, and layered on top of all this is the fact that uh, this team, the Alsos team, never really went beyond or rarely went beyond what would become the American zone of occupation. So they never looked in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and some of Germany's strongest research was, I think, being conducted in Czechoslovakia. Uh, so those are two two reasons for sort of not not believing or you know being very careful about believing uh, the Western Allies' conclusions about Germany not making progress. Uh, and then. Uh, sort of alongside that, we found some very interesting documents and indicators um, of you know, massive concern among the Allies, the intelligence assets of the Allies, uh, the leadership, the military and intelligence leadership of the Allies' concerns about progress uh, in nuclear weaponry by the Germans. Um, and these were real concerns. I mean, they spent vast uh, amounts of money and took great precaution when, when some of the vengeance weapons, the missiles, the rockets uh, that started landing um, in in Europe, uh, in London, in Antwerp, uh, they were checking them with Geiger counters. Uh, they were investigating the possibility that dirty bombs were were uh, being launched aloft in those missiles. Uh, on uh, During the D-Day uh, invasion, uh, they brought uh, raw film. To see if there were and Geiger counters to see if uh, uh, the Germans were laying down uh, dirty bombs or nuclear weapons uh, as they retreated from from Normandy. Um, vast amounts of money were spent, uh, uh, sort of in uh, mitigation type efforts. Um, so there's all sorts of indications that something larger was going on, or something more was going on. I shouldn't say larger. Um, and that, that that leads me sort of to my concluding point on this, and that is that I know, the Manhattan Project was successful, and it was huge. Um, it, it, it poured a lot of resources into a lot of people. And I, I do believe that the ALSOS team was looking for something similar to that. Indeed, the leader of the ALSOS team had been involved with the Manhattan Project. So I think he went in – uh, with this with this bias that if the Germans had something, uh, if they had made advances, it had to be uh, had to have been done by a huge team at a huge facility. Um, but we found some evidence that there were discrete sort of cells of researchers uh, in different spots throughout the Reich. Um, and some indications that they didn't know about each other. Um, but in the end, they were all sort of reported up to one man, and that uh, that's Hans Kammler. Um, and we've got some interesting uh, information in the book about 
missing documents and um, uh, some buried documents that were recovered uh, after the war as some American soldiers uh, went into Russian territory, actually into Czechoslovakia, uh, what became Russian territory, 